Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Landy Joseph. I am the co-chair of Black Planners Network. Um, we're a professional growth student organization born out of the urban and regional planning graduate program at UCLA just last year. Um, I want to say thank you to Lance Freeman and Marquise Harris Dawson for joining us today and for um, Professor Michael Lenz for being um, our moderator. Um, we had almost 200 RSVPs for the event, so we're really excited to have everyone here and for this conversation. And I'll pass it off to the rest of the BPN board to continue the intros. Yeah, um, so my name is Deja Thomas. I'm also a second year in the Masters in Urban and Regional Planning program um, and also part of BPN. And um, I'm just going to really quickly talk about kind of the structure for today. So um, we're going to have intros and uh, by Michael Lenz, and he's going to kind of introduce Lance and um, the council member. And then we'll, the, each of them will kind of have a time to talk about like their work and what they're doing. Um, and then we'll kind of have some big questions, broader questions for them. Um, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A section. If you're on Zoom right now, there should be like a Q&A little button at the bottom of your screen, um, right next to like the chat bar. And you can enter your questions there and then we'll kind of sort through them. You should also be able to um, either potentially see other people's questions and upload them so you don't have to like ask the same question that you know five or so other people have asked. Um, so that's going to be kind of like overall structure for today um, and then we're going to have um, yeah and that's pretty much it. So we're going to go ahead and have uh, Professor Lynn's kind of intro us and he's our advisor within the department and our faithful mentor. Thank you, Deja. Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Michael Lenz, Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy at the Luskin School at UCLA, Associate Director of the Lewis Center uh, for Regional Policy Studies. And, um, you know, it's a really uh, big, big pleasure. Um, it's a little bittersweet, I'll, I'll be honest, um, um, because this was originally um, an amazing uh, uh, day that, um, Landy and Deja and Prince had put together as, as, as um, really the, the founding members of the Black Planners Network at UCLA. Um, this entire day conference on, on Black placekeeping, of course, is going to be in person, is going to be in April. Um, and so, you know, I have, I have quite a lot of um, um, uh, FOMO for, for something that uh, never really happened in the same way. And, and here we are, though, I think, for what will be a, a really cool conversation on you know issues in the academy and in in public leadership around um, what they've called and what people call black place keeping, right? Um, you know, at you know on a very basic level, thinking about how to work with communities, especially um, African American communities, and um, really helping to helping them to guide uh, or. or, or uh, their communities in towards the visions that they really see for themselves. Um, and so I want to introduce our two speakers today who I'm very, very excited to see. Um, Lance Freeman um, is a professor in the urban planning program at uh, Columbia University at GSAP. His research focuses on affordable housing, gentrification, ethnic and racial stratification and housing markets and the relationship uh, between the built environment and well-being. He teaches uh, courses on community development and housing and um, research methods. Um, his recent book, um, A Haven in Hell, uh, The Ghetto in Black America, was published by Columbia University Press, and I, I cannot uh, uh, recommend this book highly enough. It um, has inspired a lot of the work I've been doing um, over the last year myself, having um, a, 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 in, engaging on a, on a book myself on black neighborhoods. And I love, love, love this book. Oh, crap. It's right here. Straight up. I'm telling you. Go Thanks, get it. My <laughs> good. He didn't, he didn't tell me to plug this. Okay, it's good. All right. Um, and council member uh, Marquise Harris Dawson is um, are also joining us as a, as a panelist. Um, he represents the 8th District of Los Angeles and chairs the Planning and Land Use uh, Committee. Uh, the council member is born and raised in South Los Angeles, graduated from uh, Morehouse College, has been a lifelong champion of um, community building and equity. 
Um, and you know what I think people love uh, uh, most about uh, Council Member Harris Dawson is he really brings a, an organizer's perspective to city government. Maybe not everybody loves that, but we love that. Um, and uh, he and his team work with residents and community organizations to implement policies uh, that combat homelessness, create quality jobs, clean streets, and encourage uh, community-based policing. Um, so I'm very, very excited to have uh, both of these uh, panelists here today. And um, I guess I will uh, kick it to, to Lance for the first uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, share my screen with you all. Uh, hopefully that'll go well. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Michael. I'm really excited to be here. Really happy uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you all about uh, research that I've been doing and, and share my thoughts on this topic of Black uh, placekeeping. Like Michael, I'm disappointed that I cannot be there in person. I think it would have been fantastic to be able to uh, be there in Los Angeles with you all and uh, you know, meet in person. But you know, hopefully, we'll make the best out of this. And uh, hopefully, you'll learn something. And I'll learn something as well. Uh, so with that said, what I'm uh, going to talk about briefly is uh, some of the work that I've done that form the foundations of my book, uh, A Haven in the Hell, The Ghetto in Black America. And as part of my conversation today, what I will be talking about is, you know, briefly, I think uh, the ghetto, and, and when I'm using that term, I'm not using it in a pejorative sense. Uh, the term has come to um, signify that these places have been spaces of disadvantage. Uh, a major argument I make in the book, though, is that the ghetto has also been a haven for Blacks, both historically and today. And I want to bring that, that background to our discussion of gentrification and how we see uh, gentrification as either a threat or an opportunity. Okay, so that's what I talk about in my brief uh, talk here this afternoon. So uh, historically, you know, and I'm sure as the name indeed implies, the, the term ghetto, uh, the term initially was used to describe places that Jews in Europe during the Middle Ages, places they were confined to, and then later during World War II, places that Jews were confined to. And the term was adopted by uh, Black civil rights activists in the 20th century as a way of pricking the conscience of America to say that here was a, a nation that had just fought two world wars, ostensibly to advance the interests of freedom, yet was confining a significant portion of its population to ghettos in a manner similar to the way uh, Jews were during the Middle Ages. And so that this negative connotation of ghetto, you know, we're familiar with that, whether it's when we think about uh, the Watts Rebellion of the 1960s or more recently, the way uh, COVID-19 has manifested itself across space and hitting um, African-American communities particularly hard. So there is this image of the ghetto as, as a place of disadvantage. And it's certainly true that in many ways it has been a place of disadvantage. But I think it's also important for us to remember that the ghetto has also been a haven. And I think that is particularly important to remember as we think about current challenges confronting many community, African-American communities. So when I talk about the ghetto as a haven, what am I talking about? Well, I'm I start in my book talking about the historical context, right? And that is the late 19th century or the turn of the last 20th century. This is the era of white supremacy, um, at, at when white supremacy was indeed at its zenith, right? Both here in the US and indeed around many parts of the globe. This is a time when Africa was being carved up by the colonial powers. Uh, and so 
at that time, this is uh, right around the turn of the last century. This is when the Great Migration begins. And you have coincident with that, um, the rise of what was at that time referred to as the New Negro Movement. Um, Jesse Binga, he was someone that migrated to Chicago around the turn of the last century. And, and in many ways, he was the epitome of the New Negro, right? He moved to Chicago. He started a financial and real estate empire. Uh, he did that by acquiring properties and opening up residential spaces that Blacks could move into. Oftentimes, there was violence involved in these activities. Uh, but he came to be emblematic of what was referred to as the New Negro. It was uh, a stance or an, a, a perspective among younger Blacks who had no direct memory of slavery and who sought to carve out a new identity for the race. And you saw this manifestation uh, not only in, economic, in the economic sphere, but also culturally as well. This is the time when uh, you had the Harlem or Negro Renaissance, when Blacks used art as a way of demonstrating their humanity, and also among the masses of Blacks. This is also the time when uh, Marcus Garvey preached the importance of self-pride. And this, too, was part of this new Negro, which I call, at that time, um, the ghetto was a spatial manifestation of this perspective. And this had some concrete uh, implications beyond economics and culture, also in politics as well. This is also translated into the first Blacks being elected to Congress in the 20th century. This was in neighborhoods in northern cities where although Blacks were being segregated, it had the uh, beneficial side effect of allowing Blacks to elect congressmen for the first time um, as they were being disenfranchised in the South due to Jim Crow. And this is something that would continue into the middle and latter part of the 20th century as well. Uh, if you think about the rise of the Black power ideology in the 1960s, again, I, in my book, I make this argument that it was in many of these same ghetto neighborhoods where Blacks um, were able to bring this ideology of community nationalism into fruition. Right? And what this translated into was Blacks having uh, more control over the institutions within their neighborhoods. It also translated into political power as Blacks were able to elect public officials in large numbers for the first time. And you also saw, see the rise of indigenous community-based organizations, such as community development corporations. Uh, you also, at this time, start to see Blacks exerting more control over local schools in their, their neighborhoods. And there, there was also, at this time, as there was in the earlier period of the New Negro, move, the New Negro movement, an artistic movement that complemented this, the, the uh, Black Arts Movement, uh, where Black artists attempted to um, use art to be in the vanguard of a political movement and to persuade the masses, to enlighten the masses of the importance of uh, self-identity and pride in their race. Uh, and so, Throughout uh, much of the 20th century, the ghetto, although it was a place that Blacks were largely confined to, it, these spaces also provide an opportunity for Blacks to create institutions for their own advancement. Right? And I think you see this continuing to today, right? where um, for many African Americans, these neighborhoods serve as a sort of homeland, if you will. Um, in, in the book, in the research that I did for the book, you see people expressing um, a sort of uh, identity, right? A sort of belonging, right? So it's a quote that I reference in the book where someone says, it's a place where I feel I belong, referring to 
uh, Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn or uh, someone even from beyond or someone growing up outside of the US perceiving these neighborhoods as a place that could come to find their identity. And also someone looking at these neighborhoods and remembering what they were, thinking about um, what these neighborhoods were like. So for example, someone I quote in the book says, when I look around here, I don't see it as it is, I see it as it could be because I know what it was. And this is someone describing a neighborhood in Pittsburgh a black neighborhood in, period, in Pittsburgh and thinking about how the neighborhood could be revitalized to create the circumstances of yesteryear. And so the point I make in the book is that uh, many of these spaces served as a haven for African Americans, places um, that black people felt comfortable in, places that black people created institutions in. And this is something that I argue continues to this day and indeed helps us understand um, some of the reactions to gentrification. Uh, gentrification, uh, which we generally we describe as a process whereby uh, middle class and upper class households have moved into low income neighborhoods is something that has accelerated toward the end of the 20th century and starting in the beginning decades of this century. And so now what you have is many cities and neighborhoods that through the latter part of the 20th century had experienced significant white flight and disinvestment now are experiencing a reversal of that and we're seeing significant numbers of reinvestment and whites moving in to these neighborhoods and i will share with you a slide that kind of depicts this pattern over the last decade decades of the 20th century and into decades of this century. And what you see, the, um, the pair of bars on the left side of this chart show the proportion of Black neighborhoods that had experienced an influx of whites, uh, whether they are neighborhoods that are 90% Black, as indicated by the red bars, or at least 50% Black, as indicated by the beige bars. And you see the two decades into this century, you see a significant increase in the proportion of black neighborhoods experiencing an influx of whites. And so I think um, probably most of us in the audience are familiar, at least anecdotally, with the notion of gentrification and an increase of uh, and whites moving in certain black neighborhoods. But the, the data also supports this perception. So it's not just something anecdotal. It is a real pattern that is, appears to be occurring. Um, it's too early to tell if what will happen with the 2020. Um, we'll see in a year or two when that data is available. But all the evidence suggests that it is a real, uh, it is a real trend that has been increasing in the past few decades. And so this this trend in gentrification, I think, is translating into a real fear uh, among many people of these neighborhoods. Um, many people express this in terms of feeling like they're being pushed out. And uh, as I was looking at, around and reading about Los Angeles, I came across an article describing a proposed development uh, in one of the neighborhoods in Inglewood, a historically African American community, and uh, one of the residents talks about feeling like, uh, here's a quote I'll share with you. She says, it makes you feel pushed out, like we don't need you guys no more. The upper class is going to be moving in. And this is a sentiment that I have found has been expressed in many predominantly Black, neighborhood, predominantly black neighborhoods across the country. I'll share with you another anecdote. This is from Washington, D.C. and what happened here, there was a cell phone store uh, that opened in the 1990s in the heart of a predominantly uh, African-American community. And uh, the store, you know, for whatever reason, started playing go-go music. Um, those of you who are not familiar with it, it's uh, a music that's indigenous to Washington, D.C. It's like the local music that's really popular there. 
And, and the proprietor would play the music um, at a decibel level, you could say, for the entire neighborhood. Uh, and this went on for several decades, at least since the 1990s. And as the neighborhood started to change due to gentrification in this decade, um, someone started to complain and say that, you know, the music was too loud. Now, in many ways, that's a minor quality of life issue. But this, um, the complaint and uh, the subsequent um, stop it, stopping of the music being played really struck a chord. And when that happened, people really, it really struck a chord and made, and really symbolized to many people that this neighborhood no longer belonged to them, right? It really echoed this feeling of being pushed out. And you see this in other cities, uh, Durham, North Carolina, again, is a, another predominantly black city that's experiencing gentrification. And you see the sentiment, people feeling like uh, they're, this is not for them, they don't belong. And it could also have real implications in terms of political power. Uh, Harlem, for example, a neighborhood that elected one of the first black congressmen in the early 20th century, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., is no longer represented by a black congressman. That's in part due to the increase in the uh, Latino population, but it's also due to gentrification as well, the changing demographics, right? So my point is that despite the injustice and inequality inherent in ghettoization, uh, the ghetto has also been a haven for Black Americans, and many Blacks still value these spaces. And I think this helps us understand the dilemma posed by gentrification. And so in my remaining few minutes, I'm just going to talk, put forth a couple of ideas, right? How do we maintain these communities as a haven? As I've argued, they have been a haven historically. Many people still value these spaces. And so it's not enough to just say, well, they need revitalization or to view gentrification as a, um, as a blessing, right? It, it, in many ways, it's a double-edged sword. So I think what most importantly is uh, the idea of community mobilization, right? The residents in these neighborhoods need to be mobilized and that will galvanize them, empower them and enable to articulate their interests, right? So here, what I'm suggesting is most importantly is that the residents are able to come together and articulate a voice in terms of what's happening. And, and just as an aside, this indeed happened in Washington, D.C., where the residents of the neighborhood where the go-go music was being played did come together and they were able to persuade the owner of the building to reverse themselves. And so the proprietor did continue to play the music. And I also think beyond um, community mobilization, we do need to think about you know, strategies for helping revitalize these communities um, to enable them to remain affordable, right? And so I think uh, subsidies are important, subsidies that can be targeted to gentrifying neighborhoods, whether it's in the form of community land trusts, which can play a really important role because they give uh, residents of the community an opportunity to actually control and own the land in their community. And so that not only do they have additional autonomy, but they can also potentially benefit if housing prices increase. Inclusionary zoning is also something I think a, a tool that can be useful in the circumstances of gentrification because what that does is it uh, requires or incentivizes any new development, any new residential development to at least include some component that is affordable and it could be in New York City, for example, they do this. Um, preferences are set aside for residents that currently live in the surrounding neighborhood. And finally, an idea that I have floated is using tax increment financing specifically to benefit residents of neighborhoods that are experiencing gentrification or revitalization. Typically, tax increment financing is used to fund infrastructure whereby an area is designated as a tax increment finance zone, an investment is made, and then uh, if property values subsequently rise due to the investment, the property tax revenue that also increases is then used to pay for the investment. 
my idea would be to take a neighborhood that's experiencing gentrification or as part of a redevelopment plan to then say, well, if the property values do increase, let's um, you set aside the increment in property taxes to benefit people who have been living in the community. And so I think, you know, I, I'll just add as a caveat, I, I'm also very active in, in fair housing issues. And so I think people who want to leave um, these communities should have that opportunity. But I do think it's important, you know, as I've emphasized, people have valued these spaces. And so we should give residents who remain behind an opportunity to stay, and just as importantly, a voice in the direction of their community. And I think if uh, we do that, we can maintain these neighborhoods as havens as they have been throughout much of their history. And I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, as you know, as I, I, I'm an unabashed fan of the book, so not surprisingly, that's right up my alley. Um, and I want to send it over to uh, Council Member Harris Dawson um, to uh, talk uh, talk about the role that uh, public leadership uh, can and does play um, in, on some of these issues. Council Member, you are on mute right now still talking you would think after six weeks of this non-stop i would learn how to get off mute before i start talking uh, um times are hard um uh thank you uh michael for having us on uh this program and thinking of us and recognizing the work that we are trying to get done in the la city council uh and thank you dr freeman for a very clear articulation of the history uh and i think the main drivers uh showing what's moving and, and um the motive forces uh, behind the situation we find in really every uh, big city in the U.S. in the black community. There isn't uh, a big city around the country. Uh, if you look at the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, you ask every member, almost all of them represent big cities that have uh, so-called ghettos in them. And all of them are concerned that the, the, the dilution of the black population is happening in their in their very districts and what the future holds for those districts. I wanted to uh, talk about um, sort of our take uh, or our perspective on some of the, the analysis that Dr. Freeman put forward. Uh, but we begin with, you know, begin this discussion with history. How do we get these communities right? In fact, uh, here in Los Angeles and across the country, many cases people were forced into these communities, right? So in, in Los Angeles, you know, there was the Central Avenue line, you know, then there was the Avalon line, you know, then there was the Western Boulevard line, then the Crenshaw line. But consistently, this city has uh, tried to, to segregate uh, black people into one section of the metropolitan region. Uh, and so from the beginning, uh, the, the, the community, the, what we call the black community is something that's forced upon us. Uh, but people stay there, uh, people build community, people invest uh, both their sweat equity and their real capital in that space, and that space uh, begins to have value and it begins to produce uh, some, some key things. Uh, one of the things that theories that we uh, put forward that I think grounds our, our uh, struggle around gentrification, and really we, we define our approach to gentrification as all out resistance, um, uh, be, because we, we recognize it as a struggle over land. And we believe that partly that struggle over land is uh, driven by the economy and driven by a particular aspect in the economy uh, that's generally referred to as the energy crisis. So uh, everybody knows we're running out of oil in a few years. Uh, in, in some, those of you who are students, probably in your lifetime will we'll run out of oil. Uh, and so the ability to get on the road and drive, you know, uh, uh, 20, 40 miles to get to work or get to where you participate in the economy uh, will become cost prohibitive. Even our mass transit, uh, which relies on fossil fuels, uh, will become more strained and become more difficult to do. And so as a result, there's this push into the cities, right, where in the 70s and 80s, even the 1960s, you saw a push away from cities uh, with the advent of, of sort of what we call our car culture. So because it's a struggle over land, uh, we think that the fight 
takes place mostly uh, in, the gov in the public sector, uh, in the places where there is the legitimate right to control land and control what happens on land. Cities have that power, counties have that power, and sometimes states have that, uh, that power. Uh, in these communities, I think for us, there are four things that are uh, important. One, uh, and, and these things can turn. So one of them is protection, right? Historically, uh, as Dr. Freeman pointed out, you can move into a black community and you didn't have to worry about the violence of right, white racism. Uh, as we saw just the other day with the brother who was driving, jogging through a community, uh, gets confronted by uh, some white folks who decided that they were the police uh, and he ends up murdered. Uh, when you're in a black community, theoretically, that can't happen. Uh, now, what I will say is that can easily turn into its opposite, particularly in the 80s and 90s. We saw black flight from black communities uh, because of violence uh, on black people committed by other black people. And so we have to be careful when we look, look at these things. These things easily turn into um, and, and turn into their their opposite, and it and, and we don't uh, take as a small thing that black flight started uh, before this wave of gentrification, having nothing to do with gentrification or what or the traditional forces of gentrification. It had to do with quality of life, mainly safety. I mean, my family moved out of South LA when I was a kid because uh, they had two black boys and they. We're just concerned with the amount of um, violence that was happening, both from community members, but also from the police. Uh, and that was focused on the, the black community. Second uh, reason why this space is important to us is it allows the space for community uh, institution building. To this day, I think the only independent black organization that owns any considerable amount of land in the entire United States is the black church. So, you know, my district, uh, which I represent historic, uh, South Central LA, the, the biggest black landowners are churches by far, like it's not close. Those churches were built in the context of the black community. They were a place where you could go every week, people could pool their resources, they could buy a building to have services in, and they could buy maybe a school uh, to educate their children, and then maybe they could buy a funeral home, and then maybe they could buy other things. And so building those community institutions over time happens in the context of black community. The other thing is culture. And so, you know, we saw the slide that had Studio Watts in it. Culture is important because the black community acts as a laboratory for people to conceive and test. And the testing is, I think, a really, really important piece of it. Conceive and test culture. So, you know, since I was just talking about the black church, I'll, I'll, I'll build up on that. Uh, much of our black music comes out of people learning music in the black church. You learn, you know, you rehearse two or three times a week in the church and you get you test on Sunday. And, and in the context of your community, people will tell you whether or not you could sing or whether or not you were a good songwriter or a drummer or whatever. And then you could take your gift to the world and, and become, you know, everybody from Sammy Davis Jr. to, to whomever. Uh, so the cultural piece is very, very important. And culture is a big driver of the direction of this country in one way or another. It's a place where black people hold a particularly advantaged position. And it's because we've been able to build culture in the context of our community. The last one, and for me, the most important one, this is the one that is the deal breaker, which is why, to me, you can't negotiate this thing away and say, well, black people live wherever you can find the best house in the you know, best situation for yourselves. And don't worry about these neighborhoods. They were forced on you anyway. Here's the thing. The base of the left in the United States is in black communities. Black people, uh, and there's data that shows that whites and other non-blacks vote more progressive based on their proximity to black communities. What do I mean by that? So if you look at the last several um, uh, presidential elections, you take the top 100 urban areas in the United States, Republicans have only won one of them once since, uh, since Ronald Reagan. George W. Bush won Dallas in the year 2000. Other than that, every city across the country uh, is dominated by whoever the center, uh, center left candidate is. Uh, and so to the extent you're going to have progressive politics in the United States, and the United States is going to be a progressive space for everybody. This, does, this is not a thing that just happens for black people. Uh, cities are important. So, you know, it's no mistake. Jesse Jackson and Barack Obama both come out of the south side of Chicago. That's not a mistake. I don't expect that suburbs are gonna produce national black leadership or 
so-called mixed or integrated uh, communities are going to produce that. And so that's why the resistance fight for us is so important. And it's mission critical uh, for, I think, the history of, of Black people, but also the history of progressive causes in the, and future of progressive causes here in the United States. In Los Angeles, uh, you know, I, I was a community organizer. The main reason I ran for city council was because the city of LA has land use authority. So we get to say what happens in, in, much, in large respect, what happens or what can't happen on uh, property. Again, we, can't, we have to do that in a race, race neutral way. So if a land is zoned for this, I can't, you can't unzone it because the wrong person owns it or the wrong person buys it. Uh, but you can set the rules of engagement for uh, real estate investment and shape that real estate investment in a way that it builds up the existing community uh, rather than drives people away or, or lets the so, the so blind hand of the market dictate uh, what's happened. Uh, you know, we believe that the Crenshaw District uh, in, in South LA is one of the most important black communities anywhere in the United States. Um, you know, three of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus represent some part of uh, uh, Crenshaw Boulevard. This is not to mention the cultural, um, the, the, the cultural aspect of what happens in the Crenshaw District, whether it's Ava DuVernay or Issa Rae or Kendrick Lamar or uh, all the rest of it that helps, again, not only provide the uh, uh, cultural content for our community, but it also is a way of saying to the world who we are and what our struggles are and what our concerns are and why you should be down with us uh, in the struggle for social and economic justice. And so, you know, it, it, it again, it is, it is a hot and fierce fight uh, and, and one that we know uh, is about our survival. And we continue to take on, on that fight and we look forward to, you know, soldiers like the ones on this call that are studying land use and gaining expertise in other topics to help uh, put their shoulder, shoulder to, the, to the grindstone to help us prevail. Fantastic, thank you. That, I mean, that is, a, is, is as clear and full-throated uh, a defense of, of a set of communities as I may have heard. Um, so here's the format as we're gonna go forward for the last 20 minutes or so. Um, I have three questions that my, my colleagues uh, at the Black Planners Network have, have uh, sent me, and um, then we'll open it up to the audience Q&A, um, which uh, I, I can already see is ro a robust conversation. So um, <clears throat> I guess the, the first question is, you know, how each of you um, apply more of a holistic equity lens to your work. So thinking about issues of sexual orientation, gender, and class in addition to, to race. Could, uh, I, can, I can go, I can take a stab at that question. That's a great question. Um, I, certainly I was drawn to uh, my, the work I've done in part due to my experience as an African-American growing up in New York City um, in the 1980s. Um, but there are, oh, since I've become an academic, uh, I have looked at uh, some of these issues as they relate to other populations, um, whether it's uh, Latinos. Um, I've done work related to, uh, I mentioned in my talk, fair housing, um, and that, of course, you know, that's an example of something that the, the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, but it has some it has grown to encompass a much larger uh, population or much larger, you know, groups of people, including people with disabilities, um, different religious groups and what have you. Uh, and so I've done um, additional work um, beyond just focusing on African Americans. I just uh, finished a report, for example, looking at how we can design inclusive spaces and inclusivity here. We're focusing on people with physical disabilities or, you know, whether it's blind or wheelchair bound. Um, so I did a, a study uh, or more of a case study analysis trying to document, you know, how can we create public spaces that are truly inclusive and accessible um, using you know, universal design principles as an example. 
So although I was initially drawn to the work I've done, as I mentioned, due to my own uh, personal experiences, I've since that time um, branched out to look at some of these issues as they relate um, to, you know, just in terms of equality and inclusivity for all different types of populations um, beyond just you know, African Americans. Uh, next question, um, can you speak towards some examples of, uh, you know, what we call black placekeeping uh, in, that have, let's keep it positive, that have succeeded? So can you, can you think about um, places that, that have maybe reflected um, some of the, the ideals of placekeeping that, that, you've, that you've talked about? The, um, you know, we, we studied this not in, not with the academic rigor, uh, um, but we, we studied this issue uh, when we got on the Los Angeles City Council to see where had Black people been successful in holding space against the most um, fierce forces of gentrification. And what we landed on, there are lots of examples where people have had pushback, but, but really the biggest victories have been achieved and continue to be achieved in Harlem, New York. Uh, so, and, and people will say, oh, well, there's lots of gentrification in Harlem. And that's, it, it's true that that is the case and Harlem isn't what it used to be. But also what, what we look at from our perch is Harlem isn't what it could be. And Harlem could easily be the rest of Manhattan. I mean, Manhattan had a lot of ethnic neighborhoods in the 1970s. Manhattan almost has none now. Uh, and Manhattan has grown so ferociously, ferociously, it's basically taken over West Brooklyn. Uh, you know, Williamsburg, uh, you know, even Fort Greene now is a very, very different uh, neighborhood. Uh, and so the power of Manhattan, the power of Wall Street, really the capital of capitalism, uh, just, you know, a few train stops away, uh, Harlem has held so that when you get off the train at 125th Street, you still know you're in a black community. And uh, even though folks lost the congressional seat there, uh, the cultural icons are there, the institutions are there, the land ownership is there. And we think it's a, a good way to approach uh, communities across the country, including uh, the Crenshaw district in, in LA. We believe that if you brand uh, uh, Crenshaw and you put our culture out on the street and our politics out on the street, uh, that you will create a situation where it's very hard to move and our community in a mass way understands that this space is something to fight over, right? So you can uh, gentrify as, you can, whoever you are, from wherever you are in the world, you can come to Harlem and say you want to invest. What you can't say is I'm going to move the Apollo Theater and turn it into a ball ballet sport yoga studio. You can't do it. That People will come after you, and rightfully so. So you want to purposefully build spaces and icons and monuments in our space that our community will not allow to be touched. And, and that's what we're trying to do through a project called Destination Crenshaw in South LA. Great, uh, Lance, I can't help but to give you an opportunity to, uh, to kind of reflect on, on the council members' thoughts on, on, on Harlan from where you sit. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I think the councilman really hit it on the head. I would echo much of what he said. I, and also, you know, I, I do think people, if you say Harlem, people might raise their eyebrows and say, oh, oh there's so much gentrification there. But, but the council person, remember, council person is, uh, is correct that um, if you go to Harlem now and you walk down 125th Street, you, you will know you are in an African-American community. And I think, I do think he's correct that, you know, some of the cultural uh, institutions that are there, such as the Apollo uh, or the Studio Museum, um, those institutions have um, give Harlem a black presence. I, I think also Harlem has a lot of public housing as much as, as much as that program is maligned, but what it has done is it has allowed a sizable number of low income households to remain in that neighborhood. So I think the combination of cultural institutions, uh, significant affordable housing, I think it has enabled Harlem to remain still to this day, even after several decades of gentrification, an identifiably black community. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanna go to the audience questions as we're, uh, we're limited on time here. So first question is for, uh, Councilmember Harris Dawson um, comes comes from our friend Rudy Espinoza. Um, 
so question is, you know more than all of us um, what LA is facing in terms of our budget shortfall and thank you for your advocacy on that. Um, what can we do to make the case for some of the ideas that Professor Freeman is highlighting to support black ownership, such as land trust, inclusionary zoning, um, you know, when money is perceived to be tight, good ideas are often put to the wayside is a concern there. Well, I think, uh, thank you, Rudy, for the, uh, Commissioner Rudy, for the question. Um, you know, I think uh, we're still, uh, you know, sort of unpacking the suitcases on this, the new financial reality. Kind of anybody who tells me that they know what's going to happen, uh, I just wait five minutes and another person will show up and say the complete opposite thing and, and e being equally qualified to say. Uh, I think, look, there's some potential that the, the investment pressure is taken off the real estate market. Maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't. Uh, you know, I think the land trust idea is a great one. We're trying to be supportive of that. Land trust is something that has to be done by organizations. The government, one cannot, especially in California because of Prop 209, we cannot really carry out the, the land trust idea. Uh, and the government should not because at any moment, as we see now in Washington, D.C., our, our opponents can seize control of the government. And uh, we wouldn't uh, want that to happen as well. So I think, you know, to the extent that land trusts position themselves as a solution to the housing crisis that we see in big cities, especially Los Angeles, they will be successful and a useful tool no matter what the situation is. Um, uh, but they've got to get up and running and they've got to be, they've got to be extremely effective in, in producing housing results. Okay, sorry. Next question. Um, so sorry for the noise there. Do you have any, do either of you have uh, a reflection on why gentrified areas are seen as more attractive for more affluent businesses? So like, you know, why do you see kind of high-end stores in places that are gentrified? Well, you know, retail, you I mean, know, it's, it's interesting. A, I One think of the, they're trying to reach the, uh, no, you go ahead, Council. Um, no, okay, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I, I think what's happening is that the stores are trying to reach what they perceive to be the, the, the new demographic in these neighborhoods, which is oftentimes young, upwardly mobile professionals who have a considerable amount of disposable income. And so I think that's, a, that's what's happening, right? They see younger people, professionals moving into these neighborhoods, and, and they know these pop relations typically have more disposable income than uh, either low-income households or even uh, middle-income or higher-income households that have children, right? And so they're tar trying to target that demographic. That's what I think is uh, what's going on there. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the struggles that uh, I think the, the gentrification resistance movement has is, is that it focuses on, you know, and I say this as a critique, uh, and as somebody who's been guilty of this critique, we sometimes focus on the shiny object. So the shiny object is the store, or the coffee shop, or the, the yoga studio. Well, by the time those things show, show up, a lot of times it's too late. Like we needed to be five years before looking at evictions, looking at, in, looking at probates. Like when our people pass away, what's happening to their pro property? Are, are their children able to take that on and you know, have families there? Are they able to keep the property within the family? Like what is actually happening? And again, by the time someone makes that kind of investment to have a retail establishment, they're looking at data that's two years old about who lives there and who's moving there and all that. And by that time, a lot of times the train has already left the station. I got a question from uh, Andre Ty Ward. Um, which is you know, definitely related to a piece of this. So how do we best support small businesses, um, particularly along the Crenshaw Corridor, uh, shifting operations during future public health emergencies and kind of how, how are we doing that now? Well, you know, I think uh, that's a LA specific thing. So I think the way you support small businesses is that you shop at them, <laughs> you give them money and for whatever service or good they provide. And you try to be creative about how to do that. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we set out on a program. Uh, we knew you would have to get seniors food in their houses if you didn't want them to leave home. 
Uh, so we quickly jumped up and said, hey, we got some people who can do that. So we, we went to all the African-American restaurants, we went to restaurants in the Crenshaw District and rest, uh, Black and Latino restaurants throughout our district and said, hey, you guys sign up for this. This is a way for you to keep your doors open, keep your employees and keep a stream of income coming in. And so, you know, look, I only know one way. If I have a business, I only know one way you can support me, and that is to do business with me. Uh, you can give me advice, and that's great, uh, but I need people to do business. And so we need to be creative about that. What are the businesses in our community? What services are they providing? And how can we shift resources in their favor? I have a question from uh, one of our uh, awesome students, Michelle Rolon. Um, to, to either of you, uh, with COVID-19 hindering vulnerable communities, what is one housing policy that you believe is necessary for uh, a more equitable post-pandemic world? If you can wave your magic wand. What are we going to what are we going to do with housing um, as we move out of this problem? Well, I think one thing we need to do now, um, even before we, maybe we get to a post-pandemic world, is think about um, making uh, housing assistance and, and say, for example, in the form of vouchers and an entitlement. I think um, what the pandemic is revealing is the precarity of many housing circumstances, right? Um, some jurisdictions have taken steps such as, um, you know, not allowing evictions to take place or, um, you know, telling banks to, um, you know, kind of a moratorium on foreclosures and things like that. But to some extent, that's just kicking the can down the road because when the pandemic ends or these moratoria and the, the bills still have to be paid. Um, and, you know, to some extent, the landlords or banks can be asked to absorb some of um, the losses, but there are limits with that as well, right? Landlords still have to buy oil, pay for heat, make repairs, et cetera, et cetera. So I, th I think some type of housing that's sort of generally available to people who cannot pay their rent and so, so that they're able to pay their rent and so it just, the problem is not just transferred into the future. It allows people to pay their rent. It allows landlords to keep their incomes and continue making repairs and what have you. I think that's what we need. Uh, and hopefully if that were enacted, it will be something that we continue even once the pandemic is over. Um, the, the last question um, is, uh, you know, an in, in inside LA one. So I'll, I'll direct it, of course, to, to Councilman uh, Harris Dawson. So, um, you know, Professor Freeman mentioned land trusts, um, which has been recently posed as a means of preventing um, CIM from taking over the Crenshaw Baldwin uh, Mall in your district. Um, do you have thoughts on this um, and, and kind of this you know, maybe more general thoughts on, on the redevelopment of the Crenshaw Baldwin Mall? Yeah, so, you know, the Crenshaw Baldwin Mall has been a saga in our community uh, and has sat at the center of our community now really since the 1980s. And we've gone back and forth with several developers and owners and plans and processes. Uh, I think unity have been built in the community around what should happen in the mall going forward. Uh, unity with some some disagreement uh you know recently a group of activists have formed uh to try to stop the sale to cim cim is a very controversial player uh in southern california real estate uh and you know haven't don't have a history of dealing with communities in a respectful way uh and so like uh like everybody else uh we have lots of concerns with their stated interest in the mall uh, and you know, want to discourage the, the decision makers from forming an alliance with them. Uh, that said, you know, the, the um, community land trust idea is a good idea. I just don't know if it's going to be in time. The investors in the mall seem to be under some pressure to unload the asset. Uh, and, it, you know, it takes some time. Putting together $125 million is not a, you know, it's not, that's not a couple community meetings. That's a that's a very, very serious endeavor that you need lots of people working on full time. Uh, and I don't, I haven't seen that uh, materialize just yet, uh, but I'm certainly supportive and hopeful uh, that it will. Thank you for that update. Um, 
and and that that inside it you know, perspective. Um, so we're we're running up against uh, one o'clock here. I want to be uh, respectful of of both Professor Freeman and uh, Councilmember Harris Dawson, and of course uh, get get everybody back to their uh, Memorial Day Friday um, in this new world. Um, and you know I want to I, I said this at the outset, but I really do want to um, acknowledge and highlight. Uh, the Black Planners Network at UCLA, uh, founded by our current students, our graduating students, uh, Deja Thomas, Landy Joseph, and Prince Asamwenji. Um, you know, it's been really a, a remarkable pleasure to to get to know uh, the three of them and to to see them uh, put so much work into um, you know what ultimately was a, a pared down and more virtual discussion today but um you know something that I'm, I'm very very proud of uh as 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 somebody who had a, a very small part in um in helping support them and um i hope that i can continue to to, to call on them to to keep this uh this new network and entity at ucla that they've uh, created going throughout the years um, and of course, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Harris Dawson. Um, this is the, the first time I believe that we've been able to to engage, um, and and I, I hope that we get many more opportunities in in the not too distant future. Um, and Lance, on the other hand, is uh, is a, a a youthful but old friend <laughs> of, of mine, and it, it's wonderful to to be here with you today. Um, and to see you um, from your your home office in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is great. Wonderful. All right. Nice well, to meet you, Council Member. <laughs> nice to meet you. Good meeting everyone as well. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share. All right. Thank you. Thank you to all the attendees for the wonderful questions and, and the discussion as well. And uh, we'll, we'll record this. I have got this thing recorded. I'll post it wherever they tell me to post it. Um, so thank you, everybody.